Welcome to Supporting Students with Disabilities in Online Learning, the fourth webinar in PLTW's Distance Learning Support webinar series. My name is Samantha Halsma. I am the Communications Manager at PLTW, and I will be serving as one of your chat moderators for this webinar. We wanted to start by briefly sharing all the distance learning supports that are available to our network. PLTW has developed supports for teachers, students, caregivers, administrators, and other educators who work with students. You can access these supports in courses in MyPLTW, in our distance learning support webpage on pltw.org, and through additional online opportunities like webinars, educator forums, and through community in MyPLTW. These resources provide information about PLTW's distance learning support, as well as guidance on creating a supportive online and blended learning experience. Today, we welcome PLTW master teachers, program coordinators, and site coordinators, as well as special education experts to share tips, tools, and strategies on supporting students with disabilities in online learning environments. In addition to, to listening to and watching the webinar, we've added a document in the chat area that includes all this content in written form. Please feel free to reference that resource as needed. Before we begin, I want to share a few tips about ways to maximize your experience. We want to hear from you. We encourage you to join the conversation, share your story, and ask questions by engaging with fellow participants and experts in the chat area. Our facilitators and experts will be available to share their experiences and contribute to the ongoing conversation of supporting students with disabilities in online learning. The webinar recording and chat log will be available on pltw.org next week, and we will also email it to you directly using the email address you provided during registration. We will be using Fun Retro to capture your thoughts and reflections on today's topic. Fun Retro is a free engagement tool where you can add your ideas, challenges, and questions. If you see an idea, challenge, and or resource that you would like to address, please like the comment so we can see which areas are of most interest to the group. And this slide outlines the structure of the board and how we, how we will be using it during our time together today. So in column one, you can see that you can share your ideas. Column two, you can submit any questions that you have. And in column three, you can share things you plan to implement based on the ideas you're hearing during the webinar. Today's webinar will be a panel discussion. So we'll pose a question and then we'll hear from our master teachers, program coordinators and site coordinators, as well as our experts. While we do that, we want you to share your ideas, challenges and questions in the fun retro. We'll take a few minutes after each panel question to address anything that you've added to the fun retro. As a reminder, the content of this webinar reflects the views and opinions of its contributors and does not reflect the official position of Project Lead the Way, Inc. or its partners. So now I would like to introduce you to our panel moderators for the day. First, we have Jason Rausch. He is PLTW's Vice President of Programs. He's a lifelong learner and has been an educator for over 25 years. Jason is a former PLTW master teacher and he currently supports development of PLTW high school curriculum and professional development. We also have Dr. Katherine Kennedy. Katherine is supporting PLTW as our online learning researcher and consultant. She has over 15 years experience in online, blended, and digital learning in pre-K through 12, higher education, and beyond. She has brought her research, practice, and policy experience to PLTW, collaborating with us to build PLTW's distance learning supports. Catherine will introduce our guest panelists. So Catherine, take it away. 
Thanks so much, Samantha, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this conversation, and thank you so much to our guest panelists uh, for contributing your experiences and expertise to this discussion today. Our panelists include three PLTW certified representatives from PLTW network schools and districts, including Chris Reynolds, who is a PLTW Launch Elementary School principal at Darnaby Elementary School, which is part of Union Public Schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Chris is also a former PBL teacher. Also from Union Public Schools, Union 8th Grade Center is PLTW Gateway Master Teacher, Chris Kinane. Chris has been teaching for 30 years. And we also have Nellie Houston, who is a PLTW Engineering Master Teacher in Digital Electronics. Nellie teaches at the Science Academy of South Texas and has been there for 14 years. I'm also excited to introduce three external experts who have joined us for this conversation as well, including Kelsey Ortiz, who serves as the founder and director of the Inclusive Digital Era Collaborative, also known as IDEC at the University of Kansas. Kelsey led a team along with other colleagues for five years as part of an IES research and development center called the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. IDEC is a continuation of that team's great work. Dr. Mary Rice was also part of that center's team at the University of Kansas. Mary serves as a research and practice consultant for IDEC currently and is an assistant professor of literacy at the University of New Mexico. And finally, we have Dr. Mark Stevens, who has been a classroom teacher of history in the Fairfax County Public Schools in Northern Virginia for 27 years. The research he conducts focuses on how marginalized populations such as English language learners and special education students are served. So thank you so much again to all of the panelists for joining us. So let's go ahead and jump into the content. Kelsey Ortiz is going to give us an overview of the policies for students with disabilities as it relates to online learning. Kelsey? Well, thanks, Catherine. I'm so happy to be here. And just as an overview, we wanted to highlight really four kind of um, very relevant key policy issues related to remote and online learning. So we all know about concerns related to access, but also there are policies that speak to learner readiness, individualized education programs, and then also parent and caretaker roles and responsibilities. So first we talk about accessibility there. These issues have major implications for how state and local education agencies respond to the movement to online um, and really just ensuring that the rights of our most vulnerable students remain intact. The, we can look at the Office of Civil Rights, also known as OCR, um, as one of the major federal agencies that protect the, person, the rights of persons with disabilities. So for an example, OCR requires that before a school or district adopts technology, educational technology specifically, that schools or districts um, make a very intentional effort to ensure that students with disabilities can equally benefit from the original tent, intent um, of the adopted or um, possibly adopted technology. And then when we talk about learner readiness, we, we can think about the work that we did at the center prior to COVID-19. Virtual schools would talk a lot about learner readiness and oftentimes on spot policy scans, I would see um, learner readiness inventories to determine if maybe uh, online learning wasn't appropriate for you. But really learner readiness is typically referred to when the student understands how to log in, how to type, being a self-directed learner and being able to operate independently while in an online course. But however, learner readiness is not a reason for students to be denied access to remote or online learning. And the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDA, um, supports this in the pro Pro and prohibits discrimination against students in educational environments because they lack skills or aptitude to perform. So instead, 
um, we um, work with students um, who have been identified with the disability um, to develop an individualized education program and get that in place to ensure that students can indeed access the curriculum so that they can be ready um, to perform all of the learning activities online. Um, in addition to learner readiness, one way we can look at how IDEA protects the rights of our students is through what I referred to earlier is the drafting of a legally binding document called an individualized education program or an IEP. So this document is supposed to be designed to meet the educational needs for learners, regardless of the severity of their disability, in order for them to be able to gain access to hardware, software, and digital curriculum, which includes uh, learning alongside um, disabled and non-disabled peers. We know from research findings that the shift to remote and online can be potentially much more restrictive specifically in terms of how much time students spend learning with one another and also just with their teacher and their instructor and even support staff. And we also know that the range of special ed services looks very different. So regardless, IDA still requires that students must have an educational program that allows them to learn in an environment that is conducive to achieving academic and functional goals. And then finally, it's really important to have a clear understanding of the role and responsibilities of the teacher and the parent or caregiver when a student with a disability is learning online. So our research has shown that parents tend to take on the burden of ensuring that children have everything they need in online and remote learning environments. However, this is not always realistic. It's not always feasible and it's not even equitable under the law. So instead, it's critical that those IEP teams discuss how parent or caregivers will be able to support that child or student and um, provide proper training um, and ongoing guidance or, and or counseling for parents and caregivers. Thanks so much, Kelsey. I know um, that was a wicked brief overview and there's so much more um, that we can share. Um, but now we're going to jump into the panel questions. Our first question, is what are some of the most common supports that you've seen schools, districts provide students with disabilities in an online setting? And this can be approaches to mitigating accessibility issues, adaptive technologies, practice-based policies, service approaches, support structures, et cetera, you name it. For our audience, um, please remember to add your ideas, questions, et cetera, in the fun retro that was linked in our chat. I'm going to go ahead and call on Chris Kinane first to hear from a gateway or middle school lens. Chris? Thanks, Catherine. Um, to go along with what we just heard about from Kelsey, I can address what I do from an accessibility and learner readiness perspective in my classroom. Um, I teach design and modeling and automation robotics. And for my class, students need to be able to access online tools and very specific software. Sometimes that's difficult to access from home and depending on a student's level of disability can also be difficult to navigate virtually. So what I would do in this case is maybe screen share with the student or create a video to show students how to navigate the specific software or the online environment. And it would obviously depend on what technology the student had at home. Um, sometimes they don't have access to the technology they need. If they didn't have access to that necessary technology, then I would simply try to adapt the project to be a demo where I show them what to do or to change it completely so that the online part was just not necessary for that particular project. Thanks so much, Chris. I especially like your ideas about showing students how to use the technology with videos and other supports so that they are successful. Um, as we shared in our latest blog post, we often assume students can use technology, but that is not always the case, as we know. Um, so how about you, Nellie? How do you address this for high school students? Thanks, Catherine. I can also talk about learner readiness. Um, I've been, I've been seeing students have a lot of success in an online learning environment this past few weeks, especially with this virtual situation, the online assignments, like was mentioned just earlier, they, they're, they're thriving. 
And um, one thing that's working really well is closed captioning. Uh, virtual meetings allow for closed captioning and voice to text transcribing and the chat communication, such as what we're doing right now with Zoom, really helps our students. Also access to recorded video demonstrations and lessons has been super, super successful. And the students love to pause and rewind as they need to ensure that they uh, learn the lesson. And also uh, sometimes having an extra person or student shadow for some of our special populations really helps uh, during these meetings to organize, to help the students organize themselves a bit, a bit better. So that's, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Nellie. That's a, a lot of different support structures, I think, that are really helpful to students. Um, Chris Reynolds, how about you with the elementary students you serve? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Uh, at the elementary level, particularly here at the start of the school year, we really had to focus on how to help parents to be the, uh, the best support that they can be to their kiddos at home. Uh, this has included utilizing visual schedules, social stories, incentive boards to help students who are hesitant to speak to find a way to participate in those conversations. Uh, we've also seen teachers using picture cues for a new technology like Seesaw and Zoom especially that gives a visual representation of those user icons uh, with an explanation of how to use those icons to increase student access to their learning. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. I know uh, visual schedules especially really help a lot of students stay on track um, with their learning and especially in this new learning environment. That's wicked helpful. Um, Mark, what strategies would you like to add? Thanks, Catherine. I think accessibility and learner readiness has been covered. I can address ways to ensure a supportive learning environment as well as meaningful you know, telepractice strategies. First, we know that students with disabilities work with a lot of different educators and support staff. Now here are some, just a few ways to be inclusive of their expertise to support students, because you can consult with SPED teachers to help fine tune lessons, consult with other collaborative team members. Reading teachers can record themselves reading passages to students if that functionality does not exist within your reading passages to students. Uh, students will be able to access the text across all subject areas. Now, speech therapists, social workers, psychologists can check in regularly with their students with IEPs and offer extra time using uh, whatever Collaborate or Zoom, whatever tool you're using. And specifically for students with IEPs, for hearing, an audiologist and deaf and hearing teacher can deliver equipment to students' houses and work with their teachers to make sure students have the equipment to hear their teachers teach the lessons. Now, the second thing I would add is how important it is to connect with parents to ensure a supportive learning environment is in place. You can also provide extra support to students with IEPs to make sure they have computers and know how to find their classroom assignments. Also, students on consult monitor can be scheduled for calls each week to speak with parents and students, review their upcoming assignments, answer questions, and to meet executive function IEP goals. I mean, sometimes these assignments can even be posted in advance like on Google Classroom. Great, Mark, thank you so much. I, I love the idea of having pre-recording text um, in all subject areas and include all of the support systems, especially like you said, the parents at home that are supporting their students and making sure that they have all of the technologies and know how to navigate those as well to support them. It's really important. Kelsey, how about you? Yeah, Catherine. So um, primarily I work with state departments of education and it is a real struggle right now to get relevant guidance out to the field. And really part of that has to do with these legal implications um, of issues that are not directly discussed or addressed in IDA. So my current work involves helping states provide information to districts about what policies say about excessive tech, assess, accessible technology, IEP development, the role of parents and caretakers and remote learning environments and making sure that we provide appropriate instruction so that students understand health and safety protocols as we transition back into hybrid and brick and school brick and mortar models. Um, we also are talking a lot about support structures that include 
um, consideration of the context from which the student is expected to learn in and how teachers can develop a greater sensitivity to the needs that are presented from the in-home environment as a learning space and how to in establish a trusting and ongoing dialogue with parents and caretakers. A few of the assistive technology needs have included um, which we see assistive technology becoming more and more of a way to accommodate learners would be use of touchscreen monitors, uh, larger double monitors, adaptive computer mouses, headphones, headsets, ergon ergonomic seating for long periods of time, and even glasses to reduce computer glare. Also, we've been working with states on how to just protect FAPE or a free appropriate public education, which is mandated under IDEA. And this is um, when students are in hybrid and remote learning environments. This means that we have to really be sure that students are responding to instruction um, that are delivered through these new technologies in a way that's beneficial to them. And this includes making sure that students and parents are equipped with the competencies and skills necessary to access, again, the digital acad academic content, the learning activities, the teachers, support staff, and most importantly, their peers. Great, great critical important information, Kelsey. And I just wanted to um, note that we had a good question about technology resources for students with visual impairment. So any of the panelists that want to jump into the chat area to answer Victor's question, please feel free to do so. Um, so Mary, how about you? Yeah, um, in the recent pandemic, uh, related remote teaching work, there's, I was able to see a lot of schools and districts and um, they have started to think about providing different programs and applications for different types of learning challenges. At the beginning in the spring, the, a lot of the districts were either buying or taking free access because a, a lot of the companies made it temporarily free to like one kind of application, maybe for video conferencing or something. And everybody just had to use that. But schools are starting to think about the functionalities of different applications to serve different kinds of needs. So like an application may or may not address um, facilitating sign language interpretation, or there may be different ways breakout rooms are structured. And, um, and so that's really, I think, a positive thing. I also, I know schools and districts have historically really liked blanket adoption on a lot of technology stuff. And then afterwards there was an immediate push to use whatever they had adopted. But uh, the array of technologies and applications and programs that are available today and the fact that accessibility still evades so many of those applications necessitates a more diverse toolkit for teachers to draw from, from the, for these students. So a lot of vendors will tell you, oh yeah, it's accessible, it's accessible, but um, it doesn't, if the students can't use it, it's not accessible, uh, no matter what that documentation says. I've also um, seen schools and districts trying to have real conversations about how the least restrictive environment requirements of IDA apply to online settings. So um, in this new schooling era, historically there was a sense that working online was either the most restrictive placement for standard placement continuum or that students could just access support the same as they would in a computer lab if they were in a school. Um, but in a recent conversation I had with a special education teacher, we, were, we problem solved around an issue for a student. We discussed things like, well, there's one-on-one -on -one tutoring as an option. There's using a breakout room with an instructional assistant as an option. Um, and then the teacher went back and talked to their colleagues and developed more ideas and um, decided that maybe recording the lecture so that the student could remain in the original classroom, but then go back and watch if they wanted was a good first step, right? To see if that helped the student. And it really was a remarkable conversation to like see that kind of problem solving go on. Yeah, that's really nice when that can happen. I think the more people coming together like we are right now and seeing all of the different responses to Victor's questions, I think is really important um, to crowdsource uh, assistance and support. So um, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, we're going to go ahead and shift to Jason Rausch, who is going to check in on our fun retro board. Jason, I'll hand it over to you.
Thanks, Catherine, and thanks everyone uh, for sharing the comments and the questions in the chat area and then the fun retro. Looks like we got three pieces on the board if you're looking at the fun retro. Um, so some of the comments that are up here, and we would like to open it up for those who'd like to participate and share out. We have a little bit of time um, looking at uh, our clock here. Uh, so I don't know if anybody would like to comment on what was posted to the board, but we had some great comments about um, using walkthroughs or parades through a design process and on shape, uh, um, separate assessments at different times, some really great points in there. Um, and then there was also the question around uh, technology resources for students with visual impairments, which um, I think Kelsey did a great job um, touching on that right when that question came up. And I think there were some other responses in there as well. So um, I'll just pause for a moment and see if anybody would like to raise their hand and share out uh, anything that was posted on the fun retro. And I only see a handful of folks on the screen at a time. So, oh, Beth, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, so I posted about the Google Classroom because that's what our school is using. So what I'm doing is that when I have a kid who has an IEP or a disability and, want, and needs extra time or needs extra scaffolding, I make two copies of the same Google Classroom announcement and the same Google Classroom assignment. And then on one of them, it's for those students separate than all students, than the rest of them. And they get like an extra handout that has the scaffolding or what they need that would address their IEP specifically. Or they get like their due date is, instead of the second, it's the fourth or whatever. And they get the, the time that's allotted for it then. But it looks like exactly the same assignment otherwise and they only get assigned one, so they're not seeing it twice, and it then calms down some of the concerns they might have. It's a great idea. Thanks for sharing. Um, we had one other on the board. I don't know if uh, whoever posted wanted to talk a little bit about uh, parades or walkthroughs. Uh, it's a great comment about uh, having them actually share out and share screens rather than forcing them to share software. Um, and working through things and getting stuck. So maybe I just stole that. That was me as well, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so what I do with my students, I teach intro to design. We're doing Onshape, um, but even with that, my students are Title I. We have crappy Chromebooks. They have five people in the house all simultaneously on the Wi-Fi, and so it's still kind of useless. Um, so what I have them do is they like make a list of what they have to do and the warm up is like, how would you make this on on shape and they have to write down like I would draw a circle this big and then extrude this far blah blah blah. And then in the afternoon session, I go through and okay you I pick Mary and she unmutes and she talks me through as we do it on a shared screen. Um, so they learn the same skill, but they don't have to worry about it and then on their own time when it's like midnight and there are not as many people on the Wi-Fi, they can go through and make their shapes. Fantastic, thanks for sharing. We had one other that popped in on the board. I was wondering if uh, we might put this out to the group and see if anybody wanted to share, but uh, getting materials to students at home, we know this is a big challenge. We basically had to schedule times for families to come in and it's been marginal in success. So this is something we're also hearing and monitoring and listening to. I wonder if anybody would like to share out kind of what you're doing in your neck of the woods that uh, might be beneficial for others. Oh, it looks like Mark's got his hand up. Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Well, we, the school I teach at is like 2000 students and it's high needs. And yes, we did follow the same thing with calling parents in to, you know, pick up computers for instance, but there's also like parent liaisons and, and various you know, social workers and people that are basically in place to, if there's a need for, especially you know, students with special needs, to make appointments and take things to them. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Well, um, I think we're ready to move on. Thank you all for contributing so much. These are just a few of the words and terms that came out in the conversation. Things like virtual simulations, online assignments, accessibility, adapt, uh, picture cues, connecting with parents, assistive technology. Um, great conversations, great questions. Thanks for sharing out. And uh, I will let us move on to question number two. Catherine, I think we're ready. 
Awesome. Thanks, Jason. And thanks so much, you guys, for uh, the great ideas and crowdsourcing um, to support each other. Uh, that's what we're here for. So our next question is, what have you seen teachers do to support students with disabilities in their online learning environments? I know we started to get into some of this now, uh, just now, but please remember, um, again, to add some of your ideas and questions in the fun retro throughout the panel. Uh, answers and we'll be checking back in with you after hearing from our panelists. So I'm going to switch it up here. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Kelsey. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, so one of the things that we've learned in looking at um, online learning and remote um, learning environments is really just there's a difference in um, just in time feedback and then learner response options. So one thing I've seen that's helped mitigate um, that is um, teachers working synchronous, synchronously with individual students or a small group of students on Google Docs, for an example, to provide real-time feedback to classroom assignments. I've seen teachers work with students to identify what we call struggle points um, throughout the learning process and then identify strategies that work with for that learner individual strategies to overcome those specific struggle points. So for an example, one teacher I was talking to was working with a student that struggled to respond to discussion boards. Um, the teacher found out that that was because of the student's um, impact from the learning disability on their um, writing long narrative text. Um, so in order to help the student not get lost and lose focus while responding to a discussion board, the teacher would work on a Google Doc individually with that student and they would work on writing bullet points. Um, on, on a topic and, and help the students stay focused to address what the, the prompt was and not get down bogged down by sentence structure or grammar. Um, another piece to this, however, is really just this trust factor that needs to happen between the student that's remote or online and between the support staff or teacher and even with peers. And by this, I mean, we have to depend on learners now to share what their struggle points really are in order for us as practitioners to help them while they're working online. And that's because teachers do not always have the what is now considered a luxury of observing student nonverbal cues and um, or even reviewing student work in process in learning process to uh, diagnose barriers to learning. So this requires students to be able to be aware of what's going on with themselves during that learning process, identify it, and then even articulate it um, of what they're struggling with in a way that they may not be accustomed to or accustomed to while they were in the brick and mortar. So that's why it's really critical for teachers and um, other supporting educators to help build kind of a new online learning dialogue that is um, provides these ways that students can articulate what they're struggling with, what they need, and then supportive feedback so that we can identify these individual strategies to help these kiddos keep moving. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. I think um, we had talked earlier about building relationships and building community in one of our first webinars. And I think that part of building trust is like key to that piece and can really help to create a support structure for the students. I think also that change in the way that you communicate and support the students in an online learning environment, making sure that they know how to communicate differently in that space is really important as well. Thank you so much. How about you, Nelly, from the high school perspective? Um, at our school, over the past six weeks that we've been back already, our teachers have been scheduling a tutorial before and after school to have one-on-one -on -one tutoring with our students to give them the attention that's difficult to provide uh, to satisfy their individualized learning plan during whole class lessons. Uh, so what we do is we provide what we do is we provide very clear lesson materials so that the students can follow them, give them expectations, make sure they understand the deadlines because sometimes their deadlines are slightly different than the whole class. And of course, give them support that they need. Again, because it's, uh, as you can imagine, 
uh, it's difficult to give them uh, the support during the whole classroom. So these two approaches, scheduling before and after and providing clear expectations, individualizing for them, is something that I found to be the most helpful. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Nelly. Yeah, the clear expectations, I think, and then also checking in with them and, and communicating in one-on-one -on -one work is really important. Mary, what have you seen teachers doing? Well, actually, back when I started researching online teachers and their interactions with students with disabilities in 2014, the, the idea that automatically struck me was the desire that the teachers had to build strong relationships with the students online. And um, often to do this, they provided emotional support in the form of inviting students to talk about themselves and listening to struggles. And, um, and another thing they did was monitor the inflow of work constantly and they would ring bells and blow horns and send text messages and make phone calls and all those things when students weren't making the pacing targets. So, um, and one, one large state virtual school arranged online teachers who supported students with disabilities into professional teams and that those, that team shared students. So they would rotate between subject matter from within this group. And then they met once a week to discuss um, how to work with these students more effectively with the help of a special education administrator. And that kind of teaming, I think, is really important, especially a team that involves someone with special education expertise. Uh, more recently, I've seen teachers move, they still want relationships with students, but they, they're moving more from those teacher-student relational models toward a greater focus on technological aspects. So um, most teachers that I work with now in a variety of school types are, they're working to make sure that students can actually get online and that they can log in and also trying to use more engaging programs and applications um, with students. One thing that I hope to see more of especially is the move from the relationship with the teacher to relationships with peers being primary and um, and also to turn to really turn more towards holding vendors and other and other platforms accountable for things like accessibility. Thanks, Mary. I did notice a question, a couple questions actually um, that might have come in, and I might have missed one up above too. Um, Matt's question, I think, is to Nellie, if I'm right. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, Nellie, if you can jump in there to answer Matt's, and I think we can circle back with Beth um, from a couple of different panelists' view. Um, and if I missed anything, please just jump into the chat and let me know if I missed your question. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, I do love the idea specifically of um, having the professional team that meets to talk about how to better support their students, like really, you know, collaborating like we are here again. Um, so let's shift over to Chris Reynolds uh, from the launch elementary school perspective. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, Actually, I think it was you that um, I was glad to hear maybe had mentioned something in regards to the importance of um, developing community, even in a virtual setting. Um, and that kind of relates to like, some of my comments. You know, we've really worked hard to increase uh, student access and participation um, in all virtual settings, right, including community time, um, which we have every morning uh, with all of our grade levels right now. Um, whole group settings, small group settings. Uh, by, but one of the things we've done is to have uh, a resource teacher log on five to 10 minutes early with some of those students to meet with them and provide a quick outline of the topics that will be discussed during that time. And we've found that this greatly reduces the pressure the students feel because they have an idea of what topics are gonna be discussed. And then ultimately the outcome is more participation, right, with less anxiety. Um, additionally, we've had teachers um, Working closely with the speech path, you know, I, I don't, we have other teachers on here and a lot of you guys may have found the start of the year is really difficult trying to get all your beginning of the year assessments uh, in a virtual setting. And one of the roadblocks we were running into was when you haven't worked with a kiddo before and you're assessing uh, from a distance learning platform, uh, a child with articulation errors, um, we've really been able to work well with our speech path to have her help those teachers 
specifically on, is this a true reading error or is this an articulation error? So just that level of collaboration uh, we found to be really important in making sure we're getting accurate assessments of our students. Um, I guess that's it. Awesome, yeah, Chris, I'm glad you brought up the, the community, the building community piece again, because I think um, thinking about social and emotional learning, one of the biggest issues there is making sure that there's a collective space of belonging and a feeling of belonging to and having an identity in community. So I think, um, and that's a huge part of building trust as well um, in a learning space. So I appreciate you um, bringing that perspective in as well. And I see that Laura has her hand raised. Laura Yarber, I don't know if you have um, ability to, on, yep, I see you on mute. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna stop. So I just wanted to comment um, or add on to Kelsey. I believe that's who shared to reinvent with our students and go and get help because it's a new world with them being online. And I sometimes notice that they, they don't even know how to navigate and how to, they don't the words to put into their mouth to help them see and help them learn and, and grow with their disabilities. One thing we've done at our school, if you've ever heard, it's called, it's a test read aloud. It's an extension. You, you have the ability to, in Google Forms or Google Docs or anything, you can record your voice and it literally puts a little link under there. And now kids can click the link, hear the question, and the whole reading comprehension and that that's kind of taken, taken and so they can actually respond to your questions. We've also used flip grids for them. Um, it does get a little bit fuzzy with, with speech, but we have them record themselves because that way it takes, you know, the, the keyboard and not knowing how to navigate that, that also alleviates some of that. Great, thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate your sharing that. And um, would you be able to maybe type into the chat so that we can capture your thoughts as well in the chat? That'd be great. Thank you for sharing. Um, so Mark, how about some strategies from you? Well, I do wholeheartedly agree with Mary in the point about building relationships, but one thing I always strive to do is also include fun, engaging things, you know, humorous things in the lessons like having breaks with relaxing music or amusing music like pink fluff unicorns dancing on rainbows or the two cellos guys that play some really interesting things. Um, it's easy in the middle of an 80 minute class to pick that in, but also conducting the brief learning checks, whether it's a survey, whether it's a, a you know, just a, a quick question thing in the middle of a, a lesson, you know, several times at different times. And also teachers I've worked with, they do plan lessons in a multimodal way. Uh, text, audio, video, to ensure students are seeing the content in a variety of ways so they can use the one that works best for them. And the best thing is you model using it and it provides good examples to students and then they can go about their business in a self-directed way. The last thing I would mention is the importance of teachers connecting with the families. I know this may have been mentioned before, parents, counselors, and administration, all these people. Uh, this can be in the form of sending in informative emails a couple times a week or even just once a week both students and parents so that they know that you're communicating with them regarding, you know, these things are focused on what's going to be done in the coming week. So people feel that you're engaged with them and something interesting, you know, is, is noticed and, and they engage with that. And also contacting the school staff if needs or challenges immerse, they're comfortable doing that. And also utilizing instructional assistants to contact students for support or counselors or, or different administration people. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate those comments. And I think we have also Chris. Chris Kinane, would you like to share your tips and strategies? Sure. Um, thanks, Catherine. I think um, several people have talked about, you know, providing extra support in different ways to students, which obviously is crucial to especially our special needs kiddos. Um, I also believe that, you know, we've got a really tech heavy world, especially with our virtual students there's really no other way to do it but sometimes i feel like less can actually be better um i mean i do believe that students should have choices in their learning 
but sometimes it's more important to limit those choices. Some students might be overwhelmed by too many choices, so maybe it's better to just give them, say, two or three choices, and that still allows for them to have ownership of their learning, but takes out that frustration or overwhelmed feeling piece, and sometimes with too many options, especially with my special needs students, I've noticed that they can get very frustrated if they have it's just overwhelming. Um, another thing I do in my classroom is I sometimes modify how I grade an assignment rather than the curriculum that's associated with the assignment. Um, not that I don't ever modify the curriculum, but sometimes it's just as easy to modify my grading. So for example, I teach in design and modeling, I teach technical sketching. So they have to, you know, I expect sketches to be in a certain place on the paper. I expect them to have straight lines and the coloring to be neat and labeled a certain way. And sometimes for students with disabilities, they may be able to sketch that object, but maybe it's harder for them to draw straight lines or to color within the lines, or maybe they don't read very well and so they can't put the label down on there. So then I just grade based on what they are able to do so they get the same amount of points, but just in a different way, because I want them to have as full a participation in my class as possible, um, but also to see that success that I know that they need to see on whatever the project might be. Yeah, wonderful, Chris. I, I totally agree that limiting the amount of choices um, makes sense so that we're not giving them so much that they get overwhelmed. It's really important. And thanks everyone for continuing to share your comments in the chat area and then the fun retro and seeing things get populated in there. Um, because of our time constraints, um, we still have one more question to go for our panelists. So I'm gonna jump to Jason to share out our word cloud. Jason? Again, thanks Catherine. Here's a recap of some of the terms, phrases from that discussion. Uh, hopefully you captured something that you'll take back to your own classrooms. Um, so with that, I think we'll just jump right into question number three. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. For our last question, we're focusing on sharing resources. So what resources would you point schools, districts, and or teachers or other educators to? Please remember to continue to share your ideas, questions, and reflections in our fun retro that will be shared out at the end of our webinar. And um, Mary, I know from our conversation leading up to this panel that you have some interesting resources to share. So we'll start with you. Great. Yeah, so uh, at the University of New Mexico, we have a Center for Developmental Disability. And within that center, faculty and graduate students have been hosting a webinar series as well about supporting students with autism and other developmental disabilities, as well as co um, collecting resources. And the goal has been to give parents and teachers tools they can carry uh, both online and offline for supporting the education of these students. And these, there, the webinars are recorded and the resources that are put out there, everything is free. And the link and the password should pop up in the chat pretty soon, if not, if it hasn't already. And then I think to sort of um, wrap up or summarize, I think I want to mention three things. And the first we've touched on a lot, which is the focused environment and helping parents set up an environment where students can learn, but also without invading their privacy. And this means that students have to, um, means parents have to understand how to help make that effective workspace with basic supplies nearby and a schedule. And students can also use timers or electronic reminders and the school can help with those materials. And um, also thinking about the, the layers of access that children are required to navigate through, including multiple logins and um, remembering lots of passwords and then in order to do your assignment you have to download, print, upload, work on it, and submit. Every one of those is a layer of access and teachers should ensure there's as few of those steps as possible. And as Chris mentioned in, in her last response, um, you know it's important to scaffold the choice making processes of students. Um, particularly if, if the goal of STEM, STEM education is to inspire creativity and so forth, then we, we don't want to pigeonhole students into where we like micro manage their choices, but we also don't want to overwhelm them. And so that scaffolding is really important. And then finally, um, I think it's really important for both parents and teachers and even students to vet the instructional materials that are online. So they, of course, accessibility 
um, but also thinking about whether or not they're engaging, like Mark said, and um, they have a suitable length and an organized flow, that they're inclusive and um, that they're accountable in some way as well. So are they telling you what data they're collecting about you and how they're gonna use it? Are they tied at all to any kind of standards? Do they reveal the goals? Do they tell you where they even are coming from or who they're funded by? Those things um, are also really important. Thanks so much, Mary. I really appreciate that. And um, Chris, how about you from the middle school perspective? Um, so my district uses Canvas. So all my students are using that resource, whether they're in person or at home, because we do have both options. But if a student struggles with, say, submitting an assignment, then I try to give them other options. Like maybe they can email the, me the assignment instead, or they can turn it on, in on paper. If they're a student that's at home, they could have their parent drop off that, that assignment if that's what is the best option for them. Um, another option that I've used is to have students video themselves. So they just video themselves explaining or showing me whatever you know they need to turn in. And then I count that as their assignment. And so we've used um, Flipgrid for that. And then Canvas within it has Studio, which can also be used for that. And then of course there's Zoom like we're doing now, um, or Google Hangouts or Microsoft Teams. Um, all of those are ways you know we can engage with our students who are not in our classroom. And so sometimes just that personal meeting with that student and maybe the parents too will help to you know get that student engaged in your curriculum because you can get to know them a little bit better and um, maybe you can explain something in a different way to them that's not just within the assignment itself. You can give them different choices, different um, due dates to try and you know meet whatever their needs might be. And hopefully by doing that, it increases their motivation as well. Great, thanks so much, Chris. How about you, Mark? There are so many tools and resources. I mean, we could spend hours talking about them, so I'll just do a couple of them. The first one is Pear Deck, which is a Chrome add-on that you can energize Google Slides. It makes them interactive and still let students write, drag shapes. Uh, today, I had my students drawing for a break, drawing pictures of puppies, you know, with the drawing tools. and then they can also go to provided websites that they can then operate themselves. So it's like right there for them. And it, it also lets you see their responses while they're writing them. And I mean, I even learned yesterday about how I can even see in one view of it, who's not working. So you can go to the chat and write a private chat, and say, dude, what's going on? But there's also tools like read and write, which is a great tool where the students can get the text read aloud to them. I mean, I know there's others, but that can be a very handy thing. Edpuzzle, which is one of those sharing things where it's engagement, quick check-ins, questions, ideas. But one of the really great things also is Newzella, which is has articles on so many different topics and it provides them in five different reading levels and it reads it aloud to them. So they're like, you can assign it to them, but they're kind of in charge of it themselves. And then just simple video making tools like we video that allows you to make the video, have your face in it as well, and then add shapes in it that draw attention to things or words that appear and then float out. So these things, you know, can be quite powerful to engage and keep students focused. Yeah, the technology definitely helps to facilitate everything that we need to do to support our students. So thanks, Mark, for, for taking the technology side of things. Sure. Nellie, um, you mentioned you had strategies as well to share. Could you share those too? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, over the last few weeks of teaching online, I have encountered a couple of extremely basic things that maybe I overlooked or most of us overlooked because they're super simple, but they're super helpful. Uh, for example, I had a student uh, that was working from home and she was having trouble calculating series and uh, voltage and currents with exponents. And uh, it was because she didn't know how to enter an exponent in her calculator. Uh, she had, so what I ended, was able to do was I was able to download a calculator emulator. Texas Instruments has a bunch 
um, and I put it on my screen. And so now, instead of having a calculator and everybody looking at their own, we look at the same calculator together. And so that helped her help so much that all my students are now using it on their phones and on their computers. I shared it as a downloadable file on my Microsoft Teams uh, classroom and everyone has it. The second thing that I often use that I find super helpful is Teams, uh, instead of breakout rooms in Zoom, uh, in Teams, there's something called channels. And so what I did is I made different channels, but instead of calling them channels, I call them tables. In my classroom right here, I have seven tables where there's usually little pods. And so they would sit at table one, two, three. And so what happens is I have the students go to these tables and they know what table they belong in. They meet at their tables in the little video chat you see, um, and you see a little camera. And I see that I have found uh, calling them tables help them make the connection to like being in the classroom, which a lot of students really miss. Um, and viewing these tables from the teacher's perspective, I can look at all these tables all at once. So I can see what they're doing. I can see, I can put students that have maybe have different disabilities in different tables, and I can see all of them in the same classroom. Instead of having the Zoom breakout rooms where you have to go in and come back out and go into the next one, you see them all at once in Teams channels, and you can read what they're saying in the chat, you know what's going on at all the tables, I also look at their engineering notebooks all at once in the, because I use uh, the OneNote in the Teams as well. And so as a teacher, I am in multiple places helping multiple students all at the same time. And so those are just two little things that I, again, it's trial and error, but I ran in through it and they're super simple, but they're super helpful. Love those examples, Nellie. And I, I love too that you're trying to make it similar to what they, you know, they're used to seeing. So I think that familiarity is really helpful, especially with the collective trauma that we're experiencing with the pandemic. So thanks for sharing that. Kelsey, I know you have a lot of great lists of uh, resources that you wanted to share as well in our companion document. Can you go ahead and highlight a couple of those? Sure. And I want to really, um, I appreciate Nellie's comments also just because there has to be kind of this bridge of where we came from and where we're going and just the idea of this is similar to what we did before but it looks different now and continuing to develop that dialogue is really exciting to hear. Um, also, I, I like the Center on Technology and Disability. That site is important because it does speak um, to multiple education stakeholders. So in addition to um, practitioners, it speaks to state leaders, district leaders, um, PD coordinators and technology coordinators. Um, and really um, that center has been try to stay a, a, above the, beyond, ahead of the curve when it comes to digital accessibility and just the, uh, lots of um, resources, little short um, engaging videos on, for an example, writing more effective alternate text, um, having digital accessibility quick reads toolkits, um, basics on access ensuring accessible student content, um, understanding your role at, as a practitioner and ensuring accessibility, um, and then also I really like um, refer often to Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. There's lots of ready-made guides that you can grab that I think will help teams just get their bearings on this new learning environment. Specifically, there's a guide out there for parents um, to get them started in understanding more about online learning. Exactly. Yeah, Kelsey, I, and, and as you know, I'm really familiar with Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, having been there for five years as their director of research. Um, we just posted those links. Thank you so much for that, Kelsey, uh, in the chat. And so, as mentioned before, we do have that companion document that was um, a resource that was shared in the chat. Um, 
if you are able to stay, um, we are going to go a little bit over. We do want to get in, um, in the fun, fun retro just to check in there. So I'm going to hand it over to Jason. I know PLTW also has uh, several supports that you can find on their distance learning webpage, but I'm going to shift over to Jason so that um, he can share the fun retro and check in with our audience. Fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. So just very briefly, and I would encourage everybody, we are going to run a little long, so I'm just going to be very brief, but would encourage you, um, even after the webinar, if you wanted to continue to contribute to the, the fun retro, um, some great ideas being shared, uh, bullet points versus sentence structure and chats and discussion boards. Um, there's some great pieces in here on um, things that people are doing about having students take screenshots and Chromebook pics and then attaching the documents. So how do you get at that gradable moment and how you uh, make that connection and that bridge. Um, a great you know, question that was raised here too that I think we're all trying to work through is adjusting pacing for distance learning. Um, everything takes a lot longer to explain, uh, to show, to prep, uh, and the semester's condensed to allow for more online timing. So maybe we'll try to follow up with some more questions around that. Um, Beth, I think you were raising your hand if you wanted to jump in there very quickly. Well, our thing is, um, our school is doing basically the first three periods, quarter one, and then the last three periods of the day, quarter two. So we're going to go through and have, we have my intro to design class, and they end their semester October 9th. And then I don't see them again until January. <laughs> and so they're, we're going, we, we need to basically go through 10 class hours of material in a week. And we only actually get five hours of synchronous time with them. Uh, synchronous Zoom time with them. Um, and even that's split up into like hour and 15 hour or 30 minute sections and broken up as well. So it's the, how do we figure out, especially for the people like me who are strapped, uh, the IED 20 is a different curriculum than what I was trained on 10 years ago in IED, um, back when it had 10 units. Uh, actually, no, back when it had four before it went to 10 and everything else. So having to modify and look at it and look ahead and figure out what parts to condense, what parts to throw out, what parts to stick together, like that whole process become is something I would like more assistance with. Unfortunately, Great. I'm bouncing, so I'll have to find out about it in the recording because I have to go to my other meeting. <laughs> well, we're glad you could join us. Um, yes, definitely. Let's follow up, Beth. Uh, these are things we're really thinking deeply about, especially with a lot of the distance learning modification work that we've done with courses. And hopefully those supports um, are, are assisting in making those decisions and, and working through those challenges. So um, again, I wanna thank everybody for contributing. Again, you can continue to contribute to the Fun Retro Board uh, moving past. And with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Catherine. Awesome, thanks so much, Jason. And um, Beth, to your point, um, I do feel like it, it's like a whole nother prep, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and honestly, I say the same mantra every single one of our distance learning webinars that it takes intentional planning. And honestly, I don't think that any teacher had enough time to do that. Any educator had enough time to do that in the spring, in the fall, you know, we're all trying to do the best that we can. So. I think um, the best thing to do is just to try to keep it simple as much as possible um, for you and for your students and their caregivers. Um, but uh, definitely the, the pre-work, um, it takes a lot of time, unfortunately. And I think too, like Mary mentioned, you know, doing the recording so that you're not doing the same thing over and over again. And that when you come together, that it's really active learning that's happening during that together time and maybe trying to do less of like the, um, you know, live instruction uh, at that time. If you, can, if you can record that and send it ahead of time, it's, it's a lot easier on your, you timing wise, and then the students can come together and maybe do some problem solving instead. Um, okay, so we are ready to hand it over to Samantha to finish us out. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone 
Um, it has been amazing to have you all here to contribute to the conversation, both the panelists, thank you so much for your experiences and expertise, as well as to our wonderful audience. And again, this is being recorded, so it'll be sent out to you, but I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha. Have a great evening, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. And like Catherine said, thank you all so much for your time today. Don't forget, we do have more virtual events coming up, including more webinars, educator forums, and office hours with our directors of school engagement. We also have some pre-recorded video resources. All of these are available on pltw.org. When you visit the site, uh, click learn more right on the home page to navigate to the distance learning section. Once there, you click the resources tab. You can locate any resource that you would like to learn more about and click that learn more button. If you want to learn about the upcoming events, you can click learn more in that section and register for any events um, that registration is open for. You click the register button there. As always, you can contact our Solution Center with any questions, comments, feedback. We will post this recording on pltw.org in approximately one week. You will also get an email with a recording and all of these fabulous resources that we have shared. So don't feel like you have to scroll through the chat to copy and paste all of that information. We will get it to you. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you learned as much as I did, and we look very forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great evening.